so we are now live on youtube i have shared the link in the group and also i am sharing the chat box okay Yes, I am muting you. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening, Nitya ji. Yeah. Namaskar. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Ajay. Good evening. Let, let me introduce, sir. Uh, he is Mr. Satya Narayan, our CEO, and Amit sir. I think you are made there in INK. I could remember. या आई रिमेंबर सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग सर आप कैसे हो बस ठीक है जी ठीक है जी एंड लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस आदित्य सर आदित्य सर इज फ्रॉम आर्टेमिस सर इज अ न्यूरोसर्जन नमस्कार सर आदित्य जी नमस्कार नमस्कार कैसे हैं हाउ आई होप यू एवरीथिंग इज गुड या इन चेन्नई थिंग्स आर शिपिंग अप नाउ बेटा नाइस नाइस हाय डॉक्टर दिव्या हेलो सर दिव्या मैडम नमस्कार नमस्कार डॉक्टर एलिस्टर इज आल्सो जॉइंड आई थिंक या या सर हैज ऑल सर वाज देयर जस्ट फॉर फ्यू मिनट्स ही हैज मेड इट ऑफ ओह ओके नो सर इज देयर ऑनलाइन हेलो गुड इवनिंग सर हेलो Sir, uh, let me introduce Mr. R. Satya Narayan. He is our CEO, Priyablis, and Dr. Alistair Jenkins. Satya sir. Ah, uh, Alistair sir. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Very nice. To <laughs> Very see nice you. meeting you. Yeah. And thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it's a great program, and all the best for the same. Yeah, thank you. So I think it looks very good. It's a great idea. Yeah. It's sort of, um, you know, how you get these pop-up shops that come and they just arrive and then disappear. This is a sort of pop-up meeting. It only started when we started talking about it a week ago, didn't we? Uh, it's really good. Really good that this can happen. The great, the beauty of Zoom. Although I have to say, I'm very fed up with Zoom meetings now. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the real thing. Absolutely, absolutely, so true. I was at my first, the reason I'm I'm in I'm in London right now, and uh, the reason for that is we had our first face-to-face -face meeting um, of the pediatric section of the society, uh, and it was the first face-to-face -face meeting I've been to in 15 months. So it's uh, gosh, it was nice, it really was. A certain amount of beer was consumed. <laughs> we are uh, already there in youtube alistair sir i have shared the thing in the uh, group as well as here in the chat box so uh, anyone wants to see the program they can see in youtube also along with the zoom okay so should we like start uh, at 7 sharp or do we usually wait what 5 minutes for i feel 7 sharp will be better sir let's start on time okay yeah sure sure 7 sharp indian time which means 5 past <laughs> <laughs> but today it's not like that <laughs> but we usually maintain the time and whatever is there we try to rather and are we going to do it within an hour is that the idea I think one and half hour would be fine. Okay. Yeah, that's enough. Well, I uh, I don't plan on taking more than fifteen or twenty minutes. Uh, so. Yes, I think unless there's an awful lot of questions, I think an hour and a half will probably be a bit more than yeah. we okay, we'd be thinking about. I think we can start it. 
Thank you. Nengah pola yang ngomong ni ya. Eh, wang lah. Pola itu sel pentering lah. Eh, sel sel. Jodhi Kumar, can you mute yourself and speak? Yeah, I am muted. We can start, Mr. Chukravarti. Yeah, I, I am making it. Yeah. So, good evening, uh, respected panelists, doctors, uh, and Shaitya sir, and all the respected viewers over Zoom and the YouTube, whoever is uh, viewing this program. Me, Nitya Gopal Chukravarti, on behalf of Rabbis, welcome you all on this. Uh, Beautiful evening, where we have been able to organize a, a rather nice webinar on an update of neuromodulation for Parkinson's disease. So we have got eminent speakers from India as well as uh, from UK. So let me take the opportunity to introduce our eminent chairperson for this evening, our Dr. Mr. Alistair Jenkins. So to introduce uh, Mr. Alistair Jenkins, that has done his MB uh, from MBCHB from Glasgow, 1980, FRCS Edinburgh, 1984, MD Glasgow. Sir has done his thesis on acute intracranial uh, hemorrhage, pathological and magnetic resonance studies. And sir presently as uh, working as a consultant neurosurgeon since 1990, honorary clinical senior lecturer and in neurosurgery, Royal Victoria Infirmary, United Kingdom. Sir has taken different honorary position. So I just wanted to put a few there. Sir is working as a president, Society of British Neurological Surgeon, member of Federation of Specialist Surgical Association, and also trustee of British Journal of Neurosurgery. Associate Editor, Pan Arab Journal of Neurosurgery. Sir is having 38 publications to his name. So we are honored to get uh, Mr. Alistair Jenkins as a chairperson for this evening. Let me take the opportunity to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh. Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh has done his graduation from Calcutta Medical National Medical College, 1998, and has done his new, uh, DNB in neurosurgery under national boards of examination. So sir is fellow of micro neurosurgery from Fujita University, Japan, completed 2011. Sir had done his fellow in neuroendoscopy in 2012. Sir has done the subspeciality training in functional and epilepsy surgery, Ohio State University, USA, and also uh, Nottingham University Hospital, UK, under uh, Professor Surajit Basu. Membership is having Neurological Society of India, Indian Medical Association, CNS, International Vista member, Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeon, member of WSSFN, and said is having 13 publications besides his name. So you are honored to get Dr. Amit Kumar goes to uh, rather become a moderator for this evening. We are honored to get Dr. Dibya KP with us. Dr. Dibya KP has done his MD and DNB. Uh, Trivandram, now Madam is uh, associated with Trivandram Medical College and the present designation and affiliation is there's assistant professor neurology, comprehensive care center for movement disorder, uh, Sri Chitra Institute for Medical uh, Sciences and Technology Trivandram. Madam, so area of interest if we quote this movement disorder, including deep brain stimulation, epilepsy, clinical neurology, and just a few achievements I have tried to put here and uh, honored and award there in an IR gold medal in MD medicine at M uh, MG University, Neurology India award for the best paper in neurology 2016, published 48 peer reviewed papers 
and several books chapter md's air surgery and elep award 2021 so we are honored to get dr divya with us we have got our eminent speaker today dr aditya kumar gupta dr aditya kumar gupta has done his graduation from aims new delhi 1994 and has done his mch from aims new delhi 1999 faculty at aims associate professor of neurosurgery 2001 to 2009 and co-founder institute of neuroscience medanta worked as an additional director neurosurgery 2009 to 2016 dr uh, gupta is currently associated as a director neurosurgery artemis agrim institute of neuroscience artemis hospital gurgaon visiting neurosurgeon royal spin alfred hospital queen elizabeth hospital hong kong advanced training at hospital la timone marcelis france dbs at parkinson's at hospital peters uh, petri paris visiting professor university of virginia usa first neurosurgeon for india to be trained on fluorescence guided brain tumor surgery from glomus uh, university of kiel germany cyber knife training university of vicenza italy with professor colombo so we feel honored to get uh, uh, such eminent speaker i would like to request uh, mr satyanar and to uh, just address our eminent speaker and to start the whole session and uh, good evening everybody uh, it's immense pleasure to invite uh, all eminent speakers dr alistair jerkins divya madam aditya sir and amit kumar sir uh, it's great honor to have you all uh, for this uh, wonderful evening for a, a scientific feast and uh, wish you good luck and uh, uh, kindly take it forward thank you very much first our chairperson uh, mr alistair jenkins to take over the stage and start the session sir Right. Very sorry about that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I found that I couldn't put my, I couldn't unmute myself while still having my slides on. So I need to feed that one back to Zoom. But thank you very much to the organisers, to Mr. Chakraborty and everyone, for so kindly inviting me to share this. Um, I was just saying before the the audience joined that this has been organised at an incredibly quick time, uh, just over a week. So I hope that um, it's to your liking. My involvement for DBS um, and in, in Parkinson's really just started many years ago and it grew out of lesioning for tremor. And this is this was one of my first patients back in 1999. And you can see it's, it's a relatively prim primitive setup. I would say the only thing that we are still using is the Lexel stereotaxic frame. And given the traditional um, parsimony of the National Health Service in the UK, it's probably the same one. This was done really almost freehand apart from the frame. We didn't do any stimulation. We didn't do any microelectrode recording and we were using the thalamus as a target. So whether it was Parkinson's tremor dominant or whether it was benign central tremor, that's really what we were using. And then of course, we started talking to each other and the neurologist and I got together and said, well, why don't we learn proper deep brain stimulation? And I went over, uh, as, as indeed um, uh, Dr. Gupta did, to the Salpetriere in France, in Paris, and learned a bit of this, and then brought it back uh, to Newcastle. Um, I have to say, our results were not too bad uh, originally with that primitive setup. This was a chap with benign central tremor. In fact, he was recategorized, and we found he actually had tremor dominant Parkinson's. But you can see his attempts at a spiral and writing his. Uh, his name. He did say one of the few good things about Parkinson's was he couldn't write checks for his wife anymore. 
But during this period, ever since that we've been refining these, it is amazing how it's progressed um, from a really rather hit and miss affair to somewhere where we can target to within a millimeter of precision. And that's become more and more important. Uh, even, even if you're using relatively large targets like the GPI, we're now subdividing that target, finding a, that millimeter, which is, is the best one. And the subthalamic nucleus, I now aim for the junction of the lateral third and the medial two thirds. And when you're talking about something that's not much bigger than a grain of rice, it shows you how we're doing. And we can check up on that because we can actually, uh, as you can see in this picture, we can select and outline our target areas. Um, and then we can see once we have the electrodes in exactly where they are. And you can see here a segmented electrode, which is able to uh, point the stimulation in a particular direction. If you're not right in the center of the nucleus, you can steer it very nicely. And you can see here on the reconstruction that that electrode is exactly where we want it. And in case you think that was just um, sheer luck, that's the one on the other side. Um, we have, over that period of time, we've dropped quite a lot of things that we did not think were really proven to be beneficial. I'll be very interested to hear what the speakers today think of that. We don't do microelectrode recording. Uh, we don't do perioperative stimulation. And we now do the entire operation with the patient asleep. And that makes it really much slicker and much more acceptable. Uh, if I start the case at nine in the morning, we have finished reliably between quarter and half past 12. And the patients usually go home the next day. So I'll be extremely interested to hear what others have to say on a lot of these things. Of course, this is a team effort. Nobody does these things on their own. And we surgeons would be lost without our neurology colleagues in particular. So to give a neurology perspective on your modulation, um, I will not introduce because she's already been introduced, but could I hand you over to Dr. Divya KP? Thank you, sir. Hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, audible. Uh, so at the outset, uh, let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, I also thank uh, Dr. Alistair Jenkins for the kind introduction. So I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so as Sarah has already given us an introduction, I'll be talking about a neurology's perspective to deep brain stimulation. So as we all know, the neurologist and the neurosurgeon, we share a very intimate relationship. And I think deep brain stimulation is one of the very important things where this relationship really matters. So having a look at the neurologist's perspective of the same, so I'll be highlighting predominantly on how DBS works in a nutshell how a patient is selected for deep brain stimulation and our experience with deep brain stimulation. I'll be brief, I'll just run you over through in 15 minutes. So I'll start with a case. So we have a 60 year old lady who was referred to us to consider for deep brain stimulation. She had Parkinsonism for three years. She reports levodopa response by history and she's currently on six doses. You can see the patient here. So she has a significant bradykinesia over there. You can see the mask facies. Now she has a levodopa responsiveness and though her gait improves, she needs assistance in on also. She also has urinary disturbances, a REM behavioral disorder and a preserved cognition. Her United Parkinson's disease rating scale, the motor scores were 62 in off and 42 in on. So there was a LDOPA response. So you can see it was, she was severely disabled. So this is in her on, you can see that the bradykinesia has improved. 
Though I wouldn't call it a robust response, but there is still a response with levodopa. And she has become independent. She can arise by herself and she can walk fairly independently. So is she a candidate for deep brain stimulation? So you can see there's a good levodopa response. Now, clinically, what we thought was she had a Parkinsonism of only three years, and she was already on six doses of levodopa. And also she had prominent urinary disturbances and a REM behavioral disorder, that was fine. But the urinary disturbances were quite early and she was also th only three years into the illness. So she had something as a red flag, the very early urinary disturbance and the gait, which was really not improving with levodopa. So this was her MRI. It was showing SWI changes, mineralization in bilateral, bilateral posterior putamen, as you can see here, and also the flare and the T2 images showing uh, putaminal, posterior putaminal hyperintensities. So this was suggestive of a multiple system atrophy. So what I wanted to convey with this case was not everybody who looks like Parkinson's disease can be taken up for deep brain stimulation, especially patients who have some atypical signs or red flags need to be really uh, followed up and looked in for before we take the patient for surgery. So that's very, very important. So what is deep brain stimulation exactly? So the role of basal ganglia in voluntary movement is very important as well as not very straightforward. So basal ganglia essentially works in selection and scaling of appropriate motor programs. That is, if you want to do a desired motor pattern, there are multiple movements that is possible. So the right program needs to be taken up. And also there is an inhibition of other motor programs which are not wanted at that particular point of time. And the final execution or performance of the selected action happens by the motor cortex or brainstem centers to which the basal ganglia output project. So it's actually the basal ganglia which scales and also selects the appropriate motor program which is then executed. So we all know that there is a direct and an indirect pathway. I'm not going to do the details of that. But then essentially what is important is Thalamus excites the cortical motor programs and the palatal output inhibits the thalamus here. So the direct pathway in general, it always facilitates the motor programs and the indirect pathway, it inhibits the motor program. So it's very simple. Indirect pathway always inhibits and direct pathway is always stimulatory. And what dopamine essentially does is it stimulates the direct pathway and inhibits the indirect pathway finally leading to a desired motor program by thalamic excitation. Now, this is a very straightforward model. This is called the firing rate model. And it explains many of the things that we know about movement disorders. However, everything is not that simple. So the overactivity of the indirect pathway in general leads to Parkinsonism and the overactivity of direct pathway leads to hyperkinetic movement disorders. So that's the simplest explanation. Now, the problem with this model is that we expect the thalamic lesions to cause an echinacea on Parkinsonism, which really does not happen. And the GPA lesions should cause involuntary movements or hyperkinetic movement disorders, which also does not happen. So also, we also see that there are many echinetic rigid syndromes which coexist. Like you have Parkinsonism with dystonia, so a hypokinetic movement disorder with a hyperkinetic movement disorder, so which cannot be explained by any of these rate models. So also the DBS or lesioning of the same target, like the GPA, it's exactly the GPA lesion should have produced hyperkinetic movement disorder, but we get a hypokinetic, it can relieve a hypokinetic movement disorder, as well as hyperkinetic movement disorders like levodopa induced dystonia, as well as dyskinesia is relieved by a GPA release. So things are not really that simple. So that, that's how came the pattern model or the explanation apart from the rate model. So basal ganglia disorders are characterized by abnormal patterns of neuronal synchrony or oscillations in the circuit component. Just as we say that in epilepsy, it's the hypersynchronous neurons which give rise to the seizures. There's a hypersynchronization, an abnormal hypersynchronization that happens in Parkinson's disease. This leads to an abnormal information in the circuit and an outflow of it to the executive centers. So this abnormal information outflow actively generates the movement disorder symptoms, and this has been supported by various animal models as well as fMRI studies. So what DBS or other ablative surgery does 
is essentially a information lesion. That is, it disrupts the transmission of abnormal information through the target nucleus by multiple mechanisms. It could be stimulation of the axonal terminals, could be inhibitory terminals are stimulated. There is a, a release of neurotransmitters. There is a depolarization block that happens. Overall, there is a blocking of the outflow of the wrong information to the executive centers, which controls the movement disorders. So how does DBS work? So be it a degenerative, heterodegenerative, static or structural insults, functional alteration, all these can lead to an abnormal neuronal firing or patterns, which leads to a synchrony in the basal ganglia circuits. This is the gamma band oscillations that happen, which produces a hypersynchronous uh, discharges in the basal ganglia. And an abnormal information processing happens, and this leads to an output of wrong commands. And so the motor, uh, the movements, which pass on to the motor cortex and the brainstem centers are also disordered. Now what DBS essentially does, it creates an information lesion and this synchrony is again broken down to produce the desynchronous discharges, which are the usually seen discharges in normal C. So deep brain stimulation usually has the stimulator, the external cable and the leads and the electrode contacts about which the surgeon will be talking. So I'm not going into that. So what are the indications for DBS in movement disorders? DBS is most useful for Parkinson's disease, followed by essential tremor and primary dystonia. It may be useful in Tourette syndrome, uh, secondary dystonias, heterodegenerative conditions, movement disorders due to secondary causes, and it's best avoided and shouldn't be done in atypical Parkinsonian syndromes like PSP, MSA, or corticobasal syndrome. So what are the indications for deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease? So we all know that there is a pre-symptomatic or a pre-motor PD phase that could be maybe 10 or 20 years early to the typical development of Parkinsonian symptoms. And then they have the early motor symptoms. And then it is actually here where the dopaminergic treatment, you the patient comes in this early PD uh, with early Parkinsonian symptoms and you give levodopa and they're really happy. But this happiness doesn't last long. And by five to 10 years, they start developing motor fluctuations and dyskinesias gradually. So then actually the drugs don't work and they are again disabled. So it is here where deep brain stimulation really works and gives a second honeymoon period to these patients with who are really disabled. So not too late into the disease and not too early in the disease. There's a right time, there's a sweet time where a deep brain stimulation needs to be offered. So what are the selection uh, criteria for patients who are undergoing DBS? One, a Parkinson's disease with a minimum duration of four years, that's mainly to rule out so that we are fairly sure that it is a Parkinsonian dis uh, disease and not any other atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. Okay. Presence of motor fluctuations compromising the quality of life with or without disabling or dose limiting dyskinesias or the presence of levodopa unresponsive Parkinsonian tremor. So your pay all the symptoms should be levodopa responsive Tremor being the only exception where tremor may not be really responsive to levodopa. However, DBS does wonders to patients who have Parkinsonian trauma. Also, demonstration of a good levodopa response, a minimum of 30 to 50% improvement in the UPDRS motor scores are uh, required before we, uh, we go for a DBS. The exception being a uh, levodopa uh, unresponsive Parkinsonian trauma. So these are the indications based on which we plan for a surgery. However, there are certain contraindications we must definitely look into. One, clinical features suggesting a diagnosis of atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. A Parkinson's disease dementia, once the patient is really affected by a bad cognition, it's not worthwhile to do a DBS. And uncorrected depression, especially patients who have suicidal ideations or active psychosis, are best not taken in that phase. We can treat the depression or the active psychosis and then consider for a deep brain stimulation. The relative contraindications include Predominant axial motor dysfunction like gait or balance impairment, even in the on state, like if you have a significant freezing, clinically significant cognitive dysfunction or psychiatric disturbance, age more than 70 years, that's relative because most of the patients, if taken after 70 years, they show up their age and cognition and axial symptoms become, become more prominent and they are disabled by them. A very significant brain atrophy or white matter changes which interfere with the surgical planning. A lack of adequate social support presence of significant other comorbidities which can enhance the surgical risk. So these are the relative contraindications. Now, who is the best candidate uh, for a Parkinson's disease, as I already said? To qualify for DBS, you can see this is a patient with, deep brains, uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease. She had a disease for around 10 years. 
she has a trust tremor that is very obvious so she has a significant disability she has she cannot uh, get up from the chair in the off state so this is what levodopa does to her she her bradykinesia improves but she has significant dyskinesias which are disabling and the on phase also in her is very short she hardly gets an improvement for a half an hour to one hour so this is an ideal patient who can be taken up for deep brain stimulation so you can see the on phase where she is able to walk however dyskinesias are interfering in giving her a normal situation so the profile of motor symptoms which are responsive to dbs tremor rigidity and bradykinesia show excellent and sustained response dyskinesias also show a sustained response however freezing of gait which is ldopa responsive is likely to respond but the response may not be really sustained postural instability or falls do not improve with deep brain stimulation and the speech may also worsen with dbs so the ideal patient for deep brain stimulation in parkinson's disease is someone who has a significant disability from tremor rigidity or bradykinesia with those limiting levodopa induced dyskinesias without much of gait disturbances like freezing balance impairment or dysarthria now what is the ideal target there's always been a tug of war between subthalamic nuclei and gpi however we always know that currently we have a very robust data that subthalamic nucleus has a good control of parkinsonian motor symptoms enabling a significant reduction in dosage of dopaminergic medications gpa does not allow for so much of a medication reduction and it actually helps in a very good anti dyskinetic effect so by and large if you have an option to go for an stn we always go for an stn and if there is some other side effects intra op or any other reason which is in not allowing us to target the stn we go for a gpa and the stn dbs improvement in dyskinesia though it is uh, because of the reduction in medicine it also has a direct anti dyskinetic effect has which has been proven in various studies so i'll just show you a couple of videos to show how actually dbs what is the life changing response that levodopa gives uh, deep brain stimulation gives you can see this is a patient who has a tremor despite levodopa he has significant trauma this is a drug off phase but in on phase also he has very little benefit with levodopa in terms of the trauma and here you can see the post op video so there is a significant improvement there's hardly any trauma and he looks as if he has no disease at all and this is quite sustained for him even at 3 years he's doing fine now he's 7 years into the illness he's doing quite fine so there is also improvement in bradykinesia and rigidity you can see there is a drug off you can see the patient who is having a significant rest tremor very significant bradykinesia in the off she is wheelchair bound and she needs help for her activities so this is one year post op you can see she hardly has any trauma the bradykinesia is improved and she is quite independent so that's the magic that dbs does so dyskinesias this is a earlier patient that i had shown so we had seen that she had significant dyskinesias so you can see post operatively she has complete improvement of the dyskinesias however freezing of gait is only a guarded improvement you can see this patient has a significant freezing of gait pre operatively he has significant bradykinesia as well as rigidity pre op pre op this is the post op where other symptoms have improved however his freezing is not really improved you can see 
that the freezing still continues. So freezing of gait or other axial symptoms are always have a guarded improvement with deep brain stimulation. So what about the long-term outcomes? We know the RCTs have unequivocally demonstrated that the superiority of DBS over uh, I mean improving the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease versus best medical treatment, it improves the quality of life significantly. And in our experience, these are our publications where we had uh, looked into the five-year as well as the 10-year uh, long-term outcome in patients who had undergone DBS from our center. And at five years, we found that the benefits of subthalamic nucleus DBS had lasted till five years, which was substantial and sustained. And only thing is after in the 10 year study, we found that after seven years, the symptoms actually, they are more disabled with the systemic as well as emotional components course declining and the quality of life deteriorates because of other axial cognitive and symptoms, mainly because of the progression of the disease and not because of the procedure. So the patient has to be carefully uh, assessed and taken up for DBS. A careful patient selection is the most important thing when we consider the outcome of the disease. So it may not actually add years to our patient's life, but they definitely add to li add life to the patient's years. The quality of life definitely improves. You can see postoperatively the patients do really well in carefully selected cases. So of course, it's always as a matter of teamwork, a wonderful patient selection, a precise target, a very precise trajectory, an excellent post-op care in terms of preventing complications, especially infections, and a good social support is very much essential and a cornerstone for deep brain stimulation outcomes. I thank my team uh, who have been really uh, helpful in uh, the videos as well as uh, in our day-to-day -day work, as well as our patients who have uh, contributed uh, to us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Divya, for making a very difficult subject very comprehensible and for giving such a, a really massive overview of, of, uh, of that subject in such a short time. Um, there's really, I, I have to say, I never understand the circuitry slides. I will understand these ones for another 10 minutes and then I'll forget again. But uh, fortunately, we've got people like you who, who know about all this. Because as you said, it is teamwork that's really important here. And I hope you have as good a relationship with your surgeons as we do with our neurologists. I'll just hand over to Dr. Gosh to handle any questions uh, that there may yeah, be. Yeah, thank you, sir. Gosh. So, Dr. Dr. Jibia, could you is, there, is there any questions from the audience side? Hello, Mr. Chakravarti. Oh, no questions are there. Uh, and, uh, I have a question to Dr. Divya. Is she, can you hear me? Dr. Yes, sir, yes. Yeah, so very nice presentation, very elaborate. So regarding long-term, you know, outcome of DVS, uh, as a neurologist, suppose after 10 years, because DVS is mostly the symptomatic treatment, we can see it cannot prevent the progression of the disease. So after 10 years or 20 years after DBS, what you see that as the disease progresses, how the patient symptoms and the neurological uh, outcome goes. We, as we know that we increase the parameters, we increase the voltage, pulse rate and everything. But at what point also, it also fails that there will be no improvement even after DBS. Yeah, actually uh, patients who have undergone uh, DBS at a young age, like patients especially who have young onset Parkinson's disease, they do quite well. It's not about 10 years. Actually, we have a patient who's like 15 to 17 years post-surgery. And he, he had a young onset Parkinsonism. The surgery was done at around 45 years. So now he's 15 years post-surgery. He's still, he's currently doing fantastic. Actually, nobody can even identify that he has a disease. The only thing is the postural instability, a mild postural instability. So you touch him, he might fall. But then otherwise he works, he goes to work, he does beautifully well. So you'll be really amazed to see him. But uh, what happens is most of our patients are not really in that age group as PD is a disease of the elderly. 
most of our patients who come or whom we do surgery, if you take the most of the patients are in the 65 around age group. So those patients, by the time they are like seven to 10 years into the surgery, they don't do that well as we would see in a young onset patient. But uh, because mainly because of the freezing, the postural symptoms that start developing. Again, by seven to eight years, they start falling. They have severe dysarthria, so they, don't, uh, they are not really happy. But what I found is actually, if you see three to four years after the surgery, the bystanders are quite happy. However, the patient feels, okay, he's not as good and all those things. But I still think that any patient who has undergone DBS at the apt time, it definitely adds to the quality of life. And at any point of time, I would say a patient who has undergone a surgery, still at 10 years is going to be better than someone who has not undergone a surgery. Like even if somebody we have done a surgery at say uh, 60, 62 years, and if I'm seeing him at 72, I'm, I'm sure that at, if he had not undergone a surgery, he would have been much worse. So the patient may not understand that, but we are really sure that he would have been, without surgery, he would have been a, in a worse state of affairs. So definitely a good patient selection is important, but even seven to 10 years later, they're disabled, but that is because of the disease. But at least there is a good uh, window period of seven to 10 years, which you can really give the patient and that really matters to most of the patients, I must say. And what is your opinion about early stim? Because there is a study, early stim, so where DBS has been advised to do very early. Yeah. So uh, early stim had actually taken patients who have were very early into the disease, maybe like uh, four, uh, like it was more uh, earlier than seven years into the study. So at least we need a four year cutoff that is given mainly to understand that they are not atypical Parkinsonism. And at that time, actually patients do very well with levodopa. There are some patients whom in which the levodopa has been started quite early, where at five to six years, that they start developing motor fluctuations and mild dyskinesias. We have quite a few patients who have undergone deep brain stimulation and they're doing quite well actually. So the only thing is we need not be really early, but then if they really have started having motor fluctuations and you're sure of your diagnosis, there's no red flags, absolutely. Then I think it's fair enough to do at even at five to seven years, uh, there's nothing really stopping us from doing. So uh, if the patient is affordable, if the patient is young enough and you're, the most important thing is if you've ruled out an atypical, then I think you can really go for it. Uh, it's really worthwhile to do a early DBS because the, the patient may be, especially in young onset patients, they may be at the stage where they lose their job and all those things at that age. So there it really helps. We have quite a few patients whom we have uh, done in the five to seven year period. They are doing quite fine actually. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Any other question, Mr. Chakravarti, from the audience side? Now, no questions in the chat box, sir. If it is there, we at the end of the program, we can address it. Yeah, yeah. Then I will request Dr. Aditya Gupta to start the presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Ghosh, and the organizers, of course, for this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, visible. Uh, so uh, actually my presentation is a bit of a basic overview presentation that is aimed at uh, physicians, neurologists, and neurosurgeons who are not very, very deeply into DBS. Uh, let's start with uh, this term, which we are hearing increasingly frequently in the medical field, which is neuromodulation. And this is basically what we do in a sense in deep brain stimulation. I think Dr. Divya has presented very elegantly a uh, lot of uh, the mechanisms, et cetera, of deep brain stimulation. But essentially what we are trying to do is alter the nervous system activity in a particular targeted structure by using electrical stimulation and even chemical agents. Now, the huge advantage and why neuromodulation is becoming so popular is simply because that it is a precisely targeted therapy to specific areas of the brain, even the spinal cord, for example, in spinal cord stimulation, rather than a systemic approach with things like pharmaceutical treatments. The other interesting thing is this kind of a therapy is highly reversible. So in case of undesirable side effects, it can immediately be stopped with the stoppage or even removal if required of the stimulating device. Now, the third advantage is that it is continuous and therefore it has a lot of therapeutic compliance that is higher over techniques that are fixed or intermittent dosing. For example, the duodopa technique, which is being used for delivery of 
uh, levodopa directly into the duodenum. And it is programmable, adaptable, and customizable for a given patient. That is the last uh, but very, very important value add. So for example, patients who have more of a predominant tremor, we know that while programming, we increase the frequency of stimulation to get rid of the tremors. Now, deep brain stimulation is actually a very, very evolved treatment that has gone through several stages of development. And what we are using routinely in our clinical practice, it is good to step back and appreciate the kind of evolution this field has witnessed over more than a century. The deep brain stimulation itself was actually discovered by chance by Professor Benabit. And if somebody is interested, I would refer them to read this very interesting article in JAMA in 2014, in which Professor Benabit describes in detail how he discovered that how while having a thalamotomy electrode in place, if uh, he did a high frequency stimulation that abolished the tremor immediately. So this set the whole field of deep brain stimulation in motion and neurostimulation is now an FDA approved established treatment for advanced Parkinson's disease. And it has been that way for now several years. And basically uh, the fundamental uh, differences in practice between different institutions stem from the DBS being of different kinds. For example, predominantly DBS is a bilateral surgery because Parkinson disease is basically a bilateral disease, although the onset may be asymmetrical. Most of the, I would say 99% of the institutions are doing a frame-based DBS. I would say a majority are still doing micro recording like that's what we are doing. Uh, most of the institutions are still doing a, a wake uh, procedure with test stimulation, and that's what we are doing. And in the last part, you anesthetize the patient for implantation of the pacemaker. So in any surgical procedure, uh, which is what every medical student knows, that there are a couple of things which go into, uh, have, go into a good surgical outcome. Now, correct patient selection, I think Dr. Divya has uh, given us a very, very comprehensive overview of how to have correct patient selection with both the indications and the contraindications and what happens in advanced disease. So uh, actually, I will not go into that in detail at all. Uh, one thing which she also alluded to is that a lot of our patients are still getting DBS very late typically about 11 to 13 years after the onset of disease. And this has been a observation worldwide. And really this has been a wake up call for all the care providers caring for such patients that this is actually too late to offer DBS. Uh, this is the early STEM study, which was being talked about. And this has very, very clearly shown that if you do uh, surgery as soon as maybe five years after the onset of disease, but with dyskinesia for no more than three years, that was the basic definition of uh, early DBS in this, uh, in this study, uh, there was a very significant difference in the outcome between patients who had early neurostimulation compared to medical therapy. So this is published and well, well, uh, well recognized, uh, appreciated paper. The other important thing is to have very, very appropriate teamwork between the movement disorder specialist who really is the keystone or the cornerstone of a movement disorder surgery team. Of course, it also needs a neurosurgeon with specialization in functional neurosurgery. And there are a whole lot of other people who are very, very important to provide good care to these patients. So the important thing is good communication a clear divisions of roles and responsibilities, an agreed protocol so that the patient can have maximum benefit of the care of both the teams. Now, uh, the surgical procedure begins with frame application. And I think just like uh, Mr. Jenkins, we use this uh, Lexel frame. Uh, I prefer to apply it in the upright position and it takes me all of five minutes to have a frame in place. Uh, after which we do a CT uh, imaging on the same day, and we fuse it with the stereotactic MRI, uh, which is typically done a few days earlier. Now, uh, 
apart from frame, the next and the very, very important thing in stereo taxi is good imaging and target planning. Basically, that is what enables the success of the surgery. So in the old days, uh, we would do something like this using ventriculography to target the uh, anterior commissure and the posterior commissure and then use coordinates indirectly to target the subthalamic nucleus. Now, the current high quality MRI images enable us to directly target structures like the subthalamic nucleus, which is what I've shown in this slide. And some newer sequences and DTI may actually play a very, very important role soon. Now, the reason why direct imaging is such an attractive proposition is because of a number of studies like this, which have shown us that there is a great deal of variability in the size and the location of the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, as Mr. Jenkins mentioned, subthalamic nucleus is really a very tiny structure. And even in a tiny structure, if there are these kind of variabilities in the position and the size, then uh, one can readily appreciate the value add of direct imaging, which has really become the choice way of targeting rather than go by the indirect targeting based on the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure. Uh, I think this has been already been addressed. Subthalamic nucleus is really by far the favored target. Uh, only in exceptional circumstances like a patient with a clear-cut psychiatric comorbidity would we go to the globus pallidus. And uh, basically, there are different ways to enable you to reach a good STN target. And we use a combination of direct and indirect methods. But really, what we fall back upon in most of the times is a direct target. The red nucleus is a very, very important guide, which we use as a check when we eventually come out with the final coordinates. We always basically use this red nucleus method uh, to cross check the veracity of our directly calculated subthalamic nucleus target. Now, there are newer MRI techniques which are being uh, in investigated. And there is a lot of exciting work which is be going into susceptibility weighted images and other uh, images which give actually a very, very fine view of the structures that we aim to target. So some examples of the QSM images uh, on the right side, which are highlighting the subthalamic nucleus so brightly. Uh, these, this would be a dream for somebody to have these kind of images to target the STN. Uh, seven Tesla MRI, of course, can show you the exact borders of the subthalamic nucleus and the surrounding nuclei. So that could actually, whenever it comes into clinical practice, uh, I think it would be a dream come true for most of us to uh, actually do a sleep DVS rather than use the microelectrode and the stimulation. Now, diffusion tensor imaging is also something which is being worked upon very actively in different parts of the world. And there is a lot of hope that in uh, a couple of years, all of us would really have a relatively standardized DTI protocol uh, for actually uh, looking at the correct part of this subthalamic nucleus to target. At present, there are several institutions that are using it for work on the thalamus uh, and using the corticospinal tract. Uh, this is a review article which highlighted that DTI provides independent valuable information uh, for targeting. And in I think within a couple of years, it would probably become more or less the a standard accompaniment to the kind of targeting which we use currently. Now, this is a schematic photograph of what we want to do in a DBS procedure. And the subthalamic nucleus here is in gray color. So the aim of a DBS procedure is to implant at least three of the four contacts which each of the electrodes has inside the subthalamic nucleus. Now, trajectory planning, therefore, is very, very important. <clears throat> and the aim of the trajectory planning is to really enable a longest pass uh, within the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, but certain things have to be taken care of. So for example, this is a hypothetical trajectory. Uh, on the At least on the dominant side, the trajectory should stay clear of the caudate nucleus. 
some degree of language dysfunction has been reported if the on the dominant side the uh, trajectory transgresses the chordate nucleus obviously when you are uh, passing a sharp microelectrode recording electrode uh, through the brain you really don't want to encounter any blood vessels which will produce hemorrhage and of course you do not want to pass through a sulcus or pass through the ventricle uh, for fear of uh, distorting your targeting because of any csf drainage and really in the sulci you always have some blood vessels present so that's the other reason for avoiding sulci now this is a video of the typical positioning which we do for these patients which is like a comfortable semi sitting kind of a position uh, i know several institutions do it in a completely supine position which is also fine after we make the burr hole and we put in the micro electro targeting gun we usually seal this with a fibrin glue uh, this prevents excessive csf egress and uh, maintains the accuracy of the targeting uh, then the micro electro recording itself uh, uh, needs some work in really inserting the micro electrodes and uh, connecting all the contacts and checking the impedance so that you have a good quality recording to guide you as to which of the five channels that we typically use was having a showing a good recording uh, and really we have been able to come down to three channel recordings in most of our cases so this is the typical audio and video track of the subthalamic nucleus it's described as rain on a tin roof so this kind of audio and a video signal is what you would expect to hear if your your micro electrode is in the subthalamic nucleus uh, so intraoperative assessment is actually very important uh, if, and that's the whole logic of doing a uh, awake dbs because it provides instant accurate feedback i think a sleep dbs is something which is probably equally good uh for the moment we are hesitant to do this for all patients uh, we would reserve a sleep dbs only for the patients that are very claustrophobic and that would not like to have a awake procedure so the intraoperative evaluation basically merits uh, needs actually an understanding of the surrounding neural structures so that based on the side effect that you may observe on stimulation uh you can actually be wiser about where your electrode is in the subthalamic nucleus and i will show you a short video of the actual process so on the left side my neuro neuro uh, neurology colleague dr sumit singh is asking the patient to move the hand and post stimulation notice the immediate improvement in the bradykinesia so this is a very very quick and very very uh, sort of uh, it generates confidence that you are in the correct place and the dbs lead insertion of course is performed under fluoroscopic guidance so on the right side you see the dbs electrode coming in in the correct position uh, we usually keep one of the micro electrodes as a check to uh, guide us to exactly the correct vertical position and post that we would typically do a very quick o arm image to check the trajectory of the implanted lead so here you can see the planned trajectory and the implanted trajectory are exactly coinciding so that is our experience in most more than 95% of the cases and i think more or less 80% of our implantations are in the central track uh now coming to a couple of examples uh, this is uh, one lady with the, who was young onset parkinson disease and you can see the short shuffling gait uh, rigidity bradykinesia and this is the same patient a uh, couple of days after the surgery uh, in the of course in the with the stimulation on and in the off uh, sort of um, she was she took medication approximately 4 hours before this uh, uh, video was captured now another example of a young onset parkinson disease uh, she had onset at 42 years of age so this is a video taken on the day of surgery 
you can see the stereotactic frame on and she is just being uh, put on the CT gantry for doing a CT scan. And look at the typical short shuffling gait that she has. And she basically was six years into the disease, uh, six years. Um, and as I said, uh, and as Dr. Divya raised the point very well, that a lot of these young onset Parkinson disease patients need to be proactively counseled for DBS, but of course they need to be taken up for DBS at the correct time. And this is the same patient the next day after surgery. So this, uh, this patient had a pronounced lesioning effect for about approximately two months. She needed an extremely, extremely small dose of levodopa. And at two years now, she is no, needing a very, very low uh, strength of stimulation. So these uh, parameters tell us that we were at the, at the correct spot in terms of the lead position. Now, the surgical risks are, the two main risks are the risk of hemorrhage and the risk of infection. Now, in the literature, several pooled series actually show very large uh, percentages of risk of infection, which uh, I'm very happy that we really haven't found in our experience. Uh, and actually the complications of a lead fracture or erosion are also not trivial. So one of the very key things to keep in mind is that the hardware has to be handled in a certain way. Uh, there are surgical nuances when we are implanting the uh, connecting wires and the battery uh, is to have relaxation loops and to make sure that a certain stretching of the neck or movements of the neck will not produce undue stress on the surgical leads. Now, the current technological advances actually allow us to do a virtual modeling of the stimulation fields. And this kind of information really helps the neurologist who is programming these patients postoperatively uh, to generate a hypothesis about their the potentially where inside the uh, subthalamic nucleus is the field of stimulation. And further, uh, the information is also gained from the intraoperative uh, information like at what depth actually was the best microelectrode recording, at what depth actually did we get the best result on a trial stimulation. So integrating all these pieces of information, this kind of virtual modeling can be done. Uh, which is very helpful for the neurologist. So uh, DBS, I think we are already in the midst of several exciting advances. A uh, couple of things to mention is that there are now directional electrodes in clinical use in which actually we can steer the direction of current to a particular side. Uh, the, the advantage of that is that probably we can have a lesser incidence of stimulation induced side effects, especially if we are using things like a sleep DBS, then this uh, may really help us even more. Uh, there is also the prospect of remote programming in which a patient can, and this is already being done, is that a patient's pacemaker can be programmed by a neurologist who is actually several hundred kilometers away by using the available uh, internet bandwidth and available uh, resources and apps which allow one to do that. So uh, we've been lucky, me and my uh, colleague, Dr. Sumit Singh, that in these past 20 years now, we've crossed 450 DBS procedures. Uh, most of the work has been for uh, Parkinson disease. Uh, of course, we have done uh, good numbers of dystonia patients, and we have actually done, done some epilepsy and even one OCD case in the past 20 odd years that we have worked together. Uh, our uh, complication rate has been uh, reasonably satisfactory in the sense that uh, the rate of um, the rate of complications has been um, uh, quite low, and basically. I would like to end my presentation by saying that neuromodulation is an exciting modality. I think in different fields, uh, we are very, very likely to see an increasing use of this modality. DBS surgery success uh, is really mirrors several basic principles of success of any surgical procedure. And I would say the most important would be case selection and good teamwork. 
So newer imaging and other technological advances are ushering in an even more exciting era of DBS and uh, neuromodulation in the future. And uh, really, I'm very fortunate to be a small part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Again, extremely lucid uh, and very, very comprehensive. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, it's, I, I love, one of the reasons I love neurosurgery is because it's both art and science. And I think nothing demonstrates that so much as the different ways we all have to do the same thing and hopefully to get similar results. I, I outlined very briefly what my method was. And although there are many similarities, there are also many differences and it's lovely to hear. Can I hand you once again to Dr. Ghosh uh, for questions before we wrap up? Yeah, thank you. Any question from the audiences, Mr. Chakravarti? Yeah, uh, no questions in the chat box. Uh, doctors, I think, who are viewing this program, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box or you can directly ask unmuting yourself. Maybe I could start off then by asking uh, you, you are still, you said, wedded to microelectrode recording and, and reluctant to let it go. Uh, and as, as you know, I, I, I did let it go some years ago. I tell you the story of that. In fact, I was putting a frame on a patient with a very bad tremor and he suddenly had a massive tremor and one of the pins the, lo locating the frame went straight through my thumbnail. And after a lot of swearing, I said, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> and, you know, we, we've done a, a pre and post uh, comparison and really there's no difference. But that relies very, very much. And you touched on this with your seven Tesla thing. It relies on having a totally homogeneous field in your MRI. And we, we spent a lot of time on that with a three Tesla. We have a very good radiographer who does virtually nothing but look at the, uh, this and do tests and things. So it is a thought. But what I was going to ask from that is, you've, you've gone from five mostly to three leads, how, uh, uh, electrodes. How often do you actually change your mind? Or do you, I've asked this question before of people and they say, well, we always choose the central one, actually. <laughs> what do you find? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. Because what happens is if I get a recording in central and anterior, uh, and I'm stimulating both to see the effect, uh, most of the times I will still end up choosing the central at the end of it all. So my rate of putting a final lead in central is around 80%. Yeah. So, and my logic of not going currently with a sleep DBS totally is that 20% in whom really maybe the outcome could be potentially be impacted. So that's and do you think that the, the segmented directional leads might have an effect on that? Might be able to steer it from only a few millimeters away, might be able to steer it towards your chosen one without the microelectrode recording. The reason I'm apprehensive of microelectrode recording, of course, is because unlike the, just for the audience, unlike the, uh, the actual stimulating electrodes, microelectrodes are incredibly sharp. And although uh, the stimulator leads may push a blood vessel out of the way, there's absolutely no chance of that with the microelectrodes. And what do you think then the, the influence long-term is going to be of these segmented leads? Do you think it will drive microelectrode recording out even more or would you still want to use it? Um, see, uh, to be honest, uh, the problem with most of the institutions in, in India and uh, uh, barring uh, teaching, large teaching hospitals like Sri Chitra and Ames is that we don't have such a tight imaging quality protocol. Uh, you know, we don't have the same person who is putting their eye on the images <coughs> and making sure there is no deviation. Uh, so I worry about the inaccuracy having an impact on my patient. Uh, I do think that directional electrodes will have a beneficial impact on pushing out microelectrode recording eventually. Uh, what most of us might land up doing is that they will implant the electrode and then do the test stimulation. So you could actually not do microelectrode recording. You could have a a wake DBS, implant the electrode, especially a directional electrode, and stimulate that externally, mm -hmm. and then leave it there. 
So I, I think uh, it definitely, uh, there is a possibility that the directional electrode will push out the need for doing uh, microelectrode recording. Dr. Ghosh, if I might ask one more question of Dr. Gupta. I noticed on your summary slide, unless I missed it, there were no patients with benign essential tremor. Are you, are you operating no. on them or not? Yes, so that's the interesting part. Uh, what I'm noticing is that in the past 20 years, I have counseled uh, 10 such patients for surgery. Uh, so none of them have actually come back for a DBS surgery. The reason being that they are reasonably happy on pretty high doses of the medications. But I'm mm. sure in teaching hospitals like Ames, uh, where I did uh, almost half of the work that I showed on my slide, and where Sri Chitra, for example, where they have a much larger experience on DBS, uh, I'm sure there they would have some more number of cases of these kind of patients. But really, in my practice, I was not able to have any of those 10 patients come back for a DBS procedure. Uh, that's just how things were. Yeah. You've obviously scared them off then. <laughs> Actually, You're much too we, honest. Had, we had only one patient with essential trauma who was willing for DBS. And, uh, but uh, uh, intra-op, he had uh, side effects and we had to back out. Uh, so finally, um, we did not go ahead. Yeah, certainly with us, I don't know what percentage it is, but we I would say probably a fifth or sixth of our patients will be benign essential tremor, and they do stunningly well. They really do. And we just use CT for that. We don't use MR. Put them to sleep, put it in with CT. I use Atlas coordinates, and it's done in two hours. It's, it's, it's great. So if I may add, I think the, the payment also makes a difference. You see, yes. even in the government institutes, the patient has to shell out a significant amount of money for these kind of procedures. And it's, mm -hmm. it's much easier to pop a tablet, even if it's 160 milligrams a day, than pay mm -hmm. those uh, several hundred thousand rupees for getting a DBS procedure done. But having said that, I think a lot of the numbers uh, internationally also are now going for a HIFU procedure. And that's really driving primer surgery a big time, at least in US and I'm sure a couple of centers in UK as well. Which is that the, the MR guided focus ultrasound? Yes. Yes. High yes. I was, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. We're, we're currently bidding for one of those. We're going to get some national units put up. Uh, but uh, they don't, for some reason, people in Britain don't seem to be able to think beyond London. That irritates me very much. I'll put you back to Dr. Ghosh. Any any further questions come up, Dr. Ghosh? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, check no. Now, uh, no questions in the chat box, sir. Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, the, both presentations were so well honed that yeah. it's very difficult to, to, to think of anything. He's already answered, so there is no questions. All the questions are already answered. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, and if you look at the comments, uh, I'd, I'd encourage both speakers to look at the comments. There's some really very nice uh, comments there saying that they're, they're both really excellent presentations. And I, I certainly felt that as well. Um, it's been great for me to be with people really from all over India and particularly from three units, which I've traditionally had quite substantial links with. Uh, Dr. Gupta reminded me, not that I needed reminding, that we'd first met many years ago when I did a visiting, uh, well, a, a visiting week in, in Ames in Delhi, which was, in, if you'll excuse the pun, indelibly printed in my memory. Uh, really enjoyed that. And we've always had a very good links with uh, Trivandrum and obviously also with Calcutta, which is the last country, the last part of the world, I should say, that I visited before lockdown here. I came straight back from Calcutta and into lockdown. Um, so I'll hand you back to Dr. Uh, to Mr. Chakraborty. I'd just like to thank both speakers and the moderator very much indeed. And thank you all very much for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. I think Mr. Jenkins and also uh, Dr. Ghosh, who has basically initiated of the whole program. I express my gratitude, Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh, so who has guided me to conduct this program there. I am thankful uh, to our chairperson, Mr. Uh, Jenkins. I am really thankful to Aditya sir and Dibya madam to be here on this evening and for 
just uh, presenting the wonderful presentation here. I have seen the comments in the comment box. And yes, we will be continuing such neuromodulation monthly basis that I was discussing with Amit sir is there. And I see that a lot of good, I think, enthusiasm there over YouTube also. So thank you, all the panelists, doctors here, and all the viewers who are uh, viewing this program here in Zoom and also YouTube. Thank you very much for being with us. Good night. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good night, Good night everyone. Take care. Goodbye.